Hey there, it's Tyler from CG Forge. In this video, I'd like to share a few tips and tricks that relate to shading and rendering out particle simulations. If you enjoyed this video, then also be sure to check out Houdini for the New Artist 2, where you'll find all kinds of awesome tips, tricks, and exercises to help you get started in Houdini. This video is broken up into a beginner conversation at the start, and then we get more into intermediate topics about midway through. So if you already know the basics of particles, then skip ahead in this video and check out the parts that are less obvious when it comes to particle shading and rendering. If you're brand new to shading particle simulations, then it's worth taking a moment to step back and ask yourself, well, what is a particle simulation? What are these dots that I'm seeing here in my viewport? And the answer to that is, well, it's just a position in space. These dots, these points or particles, they're just representing locations in space. And so whenever I middle mouse this, we have all these points which have position right here. That's the main thing that defines a point. And then we also associate other bits of data, other attributes with those specific positions. So by itself, a particle simulation is not something that you can render because it's just a position and it's just any additional information that's associated with that position. Now, in order to actually render something, that means we need to attach something to the points in order for geometry to render out in some kind of way. So just to demonstrate the, the process here of how this works, let's say that we start with a sphere and I'm going to copy to points. So if I plug in the points over here and the sphere is over there, we have this. And if I turn down the scale of the sphere like this, all of a sudden it looks like we have a particle simulation. That's basically how this thing actually renders out. And because this sphere right here is just geometry, when we shade the particles, well, it's just like shading anything else. I can turn this into metal. I can turn this into a transparent object. Again, it's just like anything else. And just to really prove the point here and follow this through, I can then set a material on this and I'm going to create a gold shader and render this out. So there you have it. It's just geometry that's been shaded gold. The material is assigned right there. Easy as that. Now, this isn't so bad when we have 1,300 points. And if we take 1,300 and multiply it times 80 polygons, that's how many polygons are in the scene, and that's really not a lot, which is why this all goes really fast. This becomes a big problem, however, once we start getting into much higher particle counts. If I have, let's say, 1,351,000 points, when we take that multiplied times 80, now we have lots and lots and lots of polygons in our scene. And if we were to copy spheres over like this with 1.3 million points, this would barely render, if not at all. So in order to accomplish this, what we end up doing is instancing objects to the points. And in order to understand instancing, we need to understand how it's faster than just copying over polygons like this. If you already understand instancing, then feel free to move on to the next section of this video. But just in case you're new to this idea, let's go over the basics. So to demonstrate this, we have, let's say, trees. And suppose that you want to copy over thousands of trees into your scene. Well, it's the same issue that we just had with our particle sim, right? We have these spheres, and if we copy them enough times, that's lots of polygons that's going to slow down or crash our scene. So how do we get around that? Well, first of all, let's understand what this tree is. And I think of it as a scroll that's filled out with a bunch of information. <laughs> so if we can think of this as all the point positions, the attributes, all the stuff that makes up the tree, that's essentially what this is. It's just data. And we can think of this as, let's say, one megabytes worth of data in size. So that's how much data makes up the tree. 
Now, when we copy this over a bunch of times, we're essentially replicating or rewriting these scrolls four times, which gives us four megabytes of data. Now, this is just like what we did with the sphere and the points, right? We just copy that over a bunch of times. Here's where instancing gets clever. Instead of rewriting the same scroll four times, we make another scroll here that is a lot smaller in size. Let's say that this scroll right here says, hey, just look over there, dude. That's the only message on that scroll. It doesn't talk about the points. It doesn't talk about any of the attributes. It just says, hey, look over there. Now we can represent that data with only 400 bytes. So very, very, very small. That's 0 0.0004 megabytes of data. And all it says is look over there to find a tree. Now look what happens to our size. We have one fancy scroll that describes everything about the tree, but then because we're able to just say, hey, look over there, this whole thing can be figured out by only using about one megabytes worth of data. It's 1.0012 megabytes in size instead of four megabytes in size. And if we do that same exact thing with our particle simulation, then that's going to allow us to keep the data small, prevent our scene from slowing down, and render this out efficiently. Fortunately for us, it's pretty easy to do this. A lot of times render engines will automatically detect that you have points and instant spheres onto those points for you. Or in Redshift's case, you can go to the object network itself, go to Redshift OBJ, particles, render object as particles. And that will essentially instance spheres onto the points. If you're using Karma, the same kind of thing is true. If you go to the stage and set down the render geometry settings node down, then we can say render points as, and we have a few options right here. Spheres, oriented disks, disks. Basically, you have a few different options of what you want to instance onto those points. I'm using Redshift here, so if we just go and assign the material, like this to our 1.3 million points. And there you have it. Now we just have a bunch of spheres like this. If I turn this down, we'll start noticing that eventually we really can't tell that we're looking at spheres. So check this out. If I now say 0 0.25 on the scale, it's going to go from something that looks like a bunch of spheres to something that now has a more fluid or sandy look to it. And if I keep going down even further, eventually you can't even tell that there are spheres here anymore. It just starts looking more like a volume or more like some kind of water or fluid of some kind. And that's one of the first tricks to know about when it comes to shading particle simulations. The size or the scale of the instanced objects make a huge difference as to how it's perceived. And the smaller you go here, the more points you'll need to fill this out, but the more fluid-like it becomes and the less grainy it feels. If I go down even further, let's say points 0, 0, 5, eventually we have something that looks like smoke. So at a certain point, bringing down the scale will get you to a smoky look. And then as you go up, it starts looking grainier and grainier. This now brings us to a more intermediate topic, and that is, well, what are your options when shading and rendering out particles? And what I mean by options is what sort of looks can you generally get by instancing spheres or other objects onto points? There's two main looks that you want to know about in order to get you started with this. One is the grainy instanced look. That's what we have right here. In this simulation that you saw in the teaser video, we have a sandy kind of particle simulation happening. And this also includes anything that's instanced. It doesn't have to be sand, it could be butterflies, or it could be anything else that you want to put on those points 
and move around in some kind of way. This is what we've mostly been looking at thus far, relies on instancing. It's quick to simulate because there's not as many points required. So if I have butterflies, I don't need as many points. I mean, unless you have an army of butterflies, right? <laughs> you can have an army of 50 million butterflies and okay, at that point it might take a while to simulate, but most of these situations are not butterfly armies. So <laughs> usually for that reason, it's not so bad, but it may take longer to render this kind of thing than the additive method that I'll show you here in a moment. This also works better when you have multiple types of objects and shaders that are instanced to the points. So the important thing when you go this route is just to make sure that everything has variety. What makes it feel really CGI and amateur is when all of these instance things look the same, they're the same size, they all kind of have the same shader. When you start mixing and matching colors, transparency, subsurface scattering, diffuse, when you start doing that kind of stuff, that's when this grainy instance look really becomes alive. Uh, now, the other thing as well is that you need to be careful about how points are spawned or removed from the scene. Because the objects are a bit bigger, if let's say a point dies and something just disappears immediately, then it can create this popping effect where things are existing and disappearing and it looks jarring because it's not gradual. So oftentimes when you have this kind of thing, you want to use the age attribute to gradually shrink down the objects and that will get rid of the flickering or the popping look that happens when things die or when they're born. As we said before, you can attach animated objects to the points. Don't forget about that. And this works pretty well with motion blur. So if you have any effects that want to use motion blur, that's when this grainy instance shading works really nicely. The other type of shading that I want you to compare this to is the additive shading method. And this is probably the closest to what you might think when you have magic or you have some kind of, you know, mystical smoke aura going on. The way that this works is that we take lots and lots of points. I'm saying like 30 million or more points. And as they overlap, their luminosity values, their emission values add as the points overlap. So if you can imagine, we have, let's say, 10 points overlapping each other. Each time a point stacks on top of something behind it, that's going to make an area brighter and brighter and brighter. Hence, that's why it's called the additive shading method. We're adding luminosity as things overlap. Now, the pros and cons to this are very different. And so the first thing that you need to know is that this relies on overlapping particles to create a volumetric looking effect. And because of that, it's heavier to simulate. As I mentioned before, for this to really work, you want about 30 million or more particles when you have a sim. What we're looking at right here is about 35 million. So if you have, let's say a whole frame filled with this additive shading, you might need 60 million, 120 million particles. It can really get pretty high in the particle count because you need lots of particles overlapping. Now, the good news is that this is very fast to render. I believe this took, well, probably about 30 seconds to render roughly. It's very fast. And then the other thing is that it requires some compositing to get the look right. So what we're looking at right here is me using a combination of LUTs, of a little bit of glow, of turning down the dark areas so that the bright areas stand out on top. There is going to be some compositing to get this look right. And you just have to keep that in mind as you're working with it. The main concern here is making things look grainy because if there's areas where there's no points overlapping each other, then that's how you can get little pockets of grain. And that grain isn't something that the render engine can fix because, well, nothing's there. So if you imagine a bunch of tiny particles, they're very, very tiny right here. If there's any gaps in between them, it looks like render grain, but the render engine can't do anything. So that's why it takes millions and millions of particles. This often works better 
thin rasterizing volumes I found. So even though this looks like smoke, and even though you might think that I'm rendering out smoke or some kind of volumetric thing right here, it's actually better to use particles that are additive because it preserves the detail better than rasterizing volumes. Something to keep in mind. I know a lot of folks try to go the volume routes when they have this kind of thing, but again, I found that that's often unnecessary. And if you want the volume to look this detailed, well, you have to have about 30 million points anyways. So <laughs> it would just add an extra step at that point. The last thing is that this works better without motion blur. You can have motion blur if you want. I don't recommend it because then it gets really, really heavy. It's lots of data once you have 30 million or more points. But if you want that look, that's the only time that I suggest turning this into a volume. And during that rasterization process, during that conversion from points to volumes, that's when you can use the velocity attribute to stretch things out and give it that motion blur look. Even then though, you don't wanna to go too far with it because it's not going to be curved motion blur. So in this case, I find, again, you're better off just having points, having a shader that makes the values brighter as they overlap, and then rendering out with either no motion blur or faked motion blur that's just a little bit using velocity and volumes. If you'd like an overview of how I made the grainy and the additive shading renders that I have right here, then be sure to check out Houdini for the New Artist 2. If you go to the bonus section, I have a few videos there that go into the details. Thanks for watching and have a great day.